Welcome back to Blue Collar Coder. Today we're going to cover Vanilla JS for React Devs. So React has been around for a while, so I can't blame you if you haven't ever tried any Vanilla JS. So all right, let me take a step back. What is Vanilla JS? Well, it's just writing directly to the browser without any framework or any of that. It's all we did before jQuery. And eventually from that, we went to template engines and then finally into like Angular and React like we have today. So why would you want to learn it now? Well, first off, it's, it's really good to understand like the underlying system that React and these larger frameworks depend on. And second, and this is just my opinion, but I think I'm seeing a real trend in rethinking how much we do on a client. Since the more that you download, the more code you put on the client, the more it has to parse, the more it probably has to do, and that's going to slow everything down. So if you want to speed up stuff on the client, one thing you might want to consider is using vanilla JS instead of some React or maybe all of your React or your Angular or whatever. Okay, so let's go and create a little app in vanilla JS. And what it's going to do is it's actually going to demonstrate a lot of the techniques that you normally do in React, but now you're going to do in vanilla JS. So in this app, you're going to have a bunch of Pokemon and that list is in JSON. So we're going to need to go fetch that. And then there's a search box that you use to highlight any matches and some quick links down here that basically just set that search and do the same kind of highlight. All right, now to make all this happen, we're going to fetch that list with the JSON. We're going to create a bunch of HTML tags using the DOM. We're going to add event listeners to that query and those links. And then we're going to update the DOM by all using, and all this is with vanilla JavaScript. And that's pretty much the majority of what we do, right? We get data we make tags, we listen for events, and we change tags, and that's pretty much it. All right, so let's dig in to make this. First, we need to set up the directory, and then I'll bring in a JSON file for the data. It's just an array of names and images. So now we gotta go get those images and bring those in. And now we need a CSS file, an HTML file, and a JavaScript file. In the HTML file, we'll need a head tag that'll bring in the CSS, and a body tag with a link to the JS, and we'll need a div where we put that list of Pokemon once we fetch it. So let's go add that. And now let's go over to the JS and let's go build that fetch. Now this fetch is going to look exactly like you'd see it in React. We will first turn the response stream into a JSON object. Cool, so now we have an array. So what shall we do? Well, we shall make some HTML from that, starting with an empty string. And we're going to iterate through that array and construct a big string of divs. And finally, I'm going to set the inner HTML of that Pokemon div to that string. Now, there's a different way of doing this using DOM elements, and I'll do that down the line here. But in some cases, it's really legitimate to make just new tags using these strings and then add them to the DOM. As it turns out, browsers are really good at turning strings of HTML into DOM elements, and, and this just leverages that. Now, I've got to go add the CSS for this, so let's just go and bring all that in. Honestly, there's nothing new here. This is just regular CSS. It's not even CSS or less or anything. But you can do whatever you want. I mean, you could do those. That's not a problem. Okay, should be good. Let's have a look. All right, so we have a bunch of Pokemon on the screen. So we've learned a couple of things. First, fetch is the same, so that's easy. Second, that you can use string templates to easily build HTML out of some data, or really anything. Also, to get a DOM element by its ID, you call document.getElementById. And finally, that every DOM element has an inner HTML that you can set. Now you can also set inner text if what you have is just a text string. Now the next thing we're going to do is build out that search input. So that starts with getting our reference to that text input. Once again, using get element by ID. Next, we'll watch for the key up event. To do this, we'll need to add an event listener. And that takes the name of the event, key up, and a function. And that function takes an event, which we're not going to use here. What we'll do is call a new function that we'll call uh, update with the value of the text input that we'll change to lowercase and then trim off the white space. Now the update function will take that text. So let's start by using document.querySelectorAll with the class name of the tile. QuerySelectorAll takes a CSS selector, thus the dot and then tile, and it returns an array of all the matching elements. If you want just one, you could use QuerySelector without the all part and that'll just give you back the first matching element. So now that we have that array, let's go iterate over that. And then we use get attribute to get the value of data-name from the element. 
and we set data dash name in the HTML down in the fetch. By convention, if you have additional data that you want to add to an element, you use data dash and then some keyword. So now we want to check to see if that matches. So we either would add active or move active from that class list. Now before I dig in, let's go see if this works. All right, it looks pretty good. So let's talk about this for a second. In particular, this data dash name thing. This is kind of a common thing to do in the world of vanilla JS or jQuery. Using the DOM itself to store some relevant data, maybe it's like data that you'll need on an event handler or whatever. You can use properties for this kind of stuff too, though when you use inner HTML like I did before, you actually don't have the access to those element references at that time, so setting properties is a little bit harder. You gotta go grade them later and then set them. So that's why I used a custom data attribute. All right, so you might be like, wait a second, the DOM is the DOM and data is data. You can't, you're kind of mixing it all up here. And I gotta say, you know, if you're looking for like Redux style purity, vanilla JS is probably not for you. In the world of vanilla JS and jQuery are pretty scrappy and definitely not pure. All right, let's go do that shortcuts thing. First, let's go over in the HTML and add some links. So now the idea here is if the user clicks on one of these, we'll put the text that's in the link into that search text and then run that search. So all these shortcuts are contained within a div with the class name shortcuts. So that's pretty handy. So let's create a query selector for that. And then we'll add an event listener for click. Now this time we're actually gonna get that event because the first thing we wanna do is prevent the default behavior, which because it's a hyperlink means like hyperlinking. And then we wanna run that search on the inner text value of the targeted link. So here we are again using the DOM as data. Using, in this case, using that text of that link as the value itself to go to the query. And finally, we wanna set that value of the search input. So all right, let's see if this works. All right, looks pretty good. Now, technically, I'm done. But I do wanna show you how to create DOM elements directly because that's another way to add stuff to the DOM. And really, both are good to know especially since inner HTML is actually like a security risk. Uh, if you just put any old, particularly user-generated content into it, and you could easily inject script tags. All right, so let me just chug through converting all this inner HTML setting code to a bunch of code that does document.create element to make div tags with a bunch of nested tags and add all that to the page. <sighs> okay, that was a bunch. All right, now let's append that tag to the Pokemon tag using append child. And once again, let's look to see if everything's working. All right, looks good. All right, now a bunch of stuff here to look at. First, we're creating these elements kind of on their own, hanging out in space, and then we get them into the DOM using something like append child. And I say something like, because there are actually a bunch of different ways to go manipulate that DOM tree. You can append, remove, move, insert. It's like a really fully functional tree a lot of different accessors that make it easy to move stuff around. Oh, and here's a hip tip for you. If you ever wanna see what you can do with a particular DOM node, just go over to the inspector and click on it, and that puts that little dollar zero on it. And from there, you can go to the console and just start hacking on dollar zero, which is the element reference to the one that you selected. All right, so let's uh, go back to the code for a second. To set an attribute, you call set attribute with a name and the value, that's pretty clear. And you can also see the CSS class name that you use calling class name. Yeah, there you go, just like React. All right, so there you have it. You got a pretty decent idea about how to modify the DOM, add stuff, listen for events, make fetch requests, now all that, that's pretty cool. You'd think there'd be a ton more, but I gotta say, honestly, this would cover like 95% of what most web apps do. And under the hood, this is actually most of what React is doing for you. React is creating a virtual DOM, and then it meshes it with the real DOM using the methods that we used right here, create elements, set attribute, all that. And actually, honestly, if this is genuinely new to you, then I'm excited for you. You know, my recommendation, just go pick a project, like a to-do list or something, and go make it using vanilla JS. In some ways, it'll be like scary, because you probably say to yourself, whoa, this is not gonna scale up to something huge, and you're definitely right about that. But for me, sometimes I do think the opposite side is also true, that bring in React for every project is like, tenderizing a pork loin with a sledgehammer. I mean, I like sledgehammers and I like pork, but the combination of the two is, is not awesome. So sometimes I use React for stuff and sometimes I use Vue or Svelte 
And then sometimes I just use vanilla JS. So one thing I've been thinking about a lot lately is the possibility of using React on the server side to render the page either like by a curl request or as part of a Jamstack build process. But instead of using React on the client, we use vanilla JS instead. And some advantages and some disadvantages, obviously, but it's still something worth thinking about, particularly for like client side performance reasons. Of course, for bigger applications, I probably still use Babel and Webpack, or in my case, Parcel. But those things work just fine in vanilla JS context. All right, folks, I hope you found this helpful. If you have, then like or comment or subscribe. I'm always up for that. See you next time on Blue Collar Coder, and be kind to each other. All right, I normally fade to black, but I'm just going to add a little history lesson appendix here, and you can feel free to bail if you want. But I did want to cover like the whole jQuery versus vanilla JS thing. So why do we have jQuery? Well, back in the day, like we didn't actually have document.querySelector and document.querySelector all. So finding elements by a class name or a CSS selector was, wow, a lot of work. So that's why there's query in the name jQuery. That's actually the value that it brought. It was go and do what document.querySelector and document.querySelector all do today and give you back a list of elements for a given CSS selector, which was a big deal, a really big deal. But of course, we have that today, so I'm not sure, you know, if we still need that. The next thing that jQuery did was normalize how we make AJAX requests. So at the time, IE did it one way, and everybody else did it a different way. So you'd have to basically go and kind of first search for, first search for IE, and then if you didn't see IE, then you'd make this different request, and it would have pain in the butt. But now we've got fetch, so that's that. And finally, the last thing that jQuery does, and still does today, is make batch handling of elements really easy. Like, let's say you want to go and apply a click handler to everything, jQuery makes that a snap. And I would say, actually, you probably don't have that. I mean, you could make a function that does that, but really don't have an analog for that. But is that a, a thing? Is that a reason to bring in all of jQuery? Uh, probably not. So the point of all this is just to say that for me and my work, I'm probably going to either use a framework or I'm going to use vanilla JS. I'm probably not going to use a framework jQuery and vanilla JS because I just don't find that currently jQuery provides enough value that isn't handled by either of those two. All right, guys, enough for this little impromptu history lesson. I'll see you on the next one.